Hi everyone, welcome to the HKDI Inspire Prototyping the Future 2022 lecture series. Uh, I'm Keith Tam, I'm Head of Communication Design at the Hong Kong Learning Institute. Um, we started the HKDI Inspire events back in 2018, and this is our fourth time round. And we started uh, with the premise that design thinking is by nature interdisciplinary. We've explored a lot of different issues related to design and other fields working in tandem to improve different aspects of our lives. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Yatsu. I think it's a name that probably doesn't need a lot of introduction. He's the chairman of app developer Animoca, which was founded in 2011, and a related game developer and venture capital company Animoca Brands, established in 2018. Uh, Yat was born in Austria, he started his career at Atari, Germany, do you remember Atari, before moving to Hong Kong in 1996, where he set up the innovative free website and email company, Cyber City. He then set up Outblaze in 1998 during the first dot-com explosion, remember that? Uh, it started out as a messaging company. Uh, they were known for the anti-spam protection. Uh, that part of the company was sold to IBM uh, back in 2009, and it's now a games, social media, and online transaction systems and web communications company. Uh, Animoca, uh, you've probably heard of Animoca. I'm sure you have heard of Animoca, in fact. And uh, they've uh, developed games uh, like The Sandbox, Crazy Kings, and Crazy Defense Heroes. So uh, the topic today is the true metaverse will be decentralized. I think it's a very interesting and timely topic. And uh, I'm not going to read through the, the description, I think. Uh, without further ado, I, I'd like to uh, introduce Yat yeah. to the stage, proverbially. <laughs> All right. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, yes. it's a great pleasure being here. Uh, so I guess, uh, as suggested, I will give a little bit of a talk to, um, to everyone here, and then afterwards we can open to Q&A. So it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. As I mentioned, my name is Yat. I'm chairman and co-founder of Animoga Brands, which is a Hong Kong-based company. Uh, although I am currently stuck in the US <laughs> and unable to return to Hong Kong, but hopefully very soon with all the opening of the restrictions. My talk today is really talking about, you know, non-fungible tokens, the metaverse and digital property rights, favorite topic of ours, and somewhat the mission of Animoga Brands. But I'll talk less about our company and more about sort of how we see the future and why we're so excited about the metaverse. So first of all, quickly, Animoca Brands uh, said company that uh, was founded in Hong Kong. Uh, we actually have almost 700 people around the world today, uh, globally. Uh, and you know we have over 150 portfolio companies. Uh, the most famous ones of these companies uh, are you know, OpenSea, uh, you know, Dapper Labs, Sky Mavis, which is a company about Axie Infinity, Wax, Decentraland, uh, and a whole bunch of other companies. Uh, if you're already looking in NFTs, uh, and metaverse projects, you, you might have heard of us. We're also the owners of the Sandbox, of Rev Racing, Gamey, Quid. Uh, most recently, we were intimately involved in the launch of ApeCoin, and I'm also serving on the council of ApeCoin. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, it's sort of uh, related to uh, the Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, uh, Yuga Labs, which is also the owner of CryptoPunks and Mebits. Anyway, so let's talk about the metaverse and why we think it's such an amazing and exciting time for all of us. But let's start first with defining, to some extent, what we think the metaverse is, because everyone has slightly different definitions. And you can see how not just Facebook, who renamed themselves Meta recently, or Microsoft acquiring you know, Activision, these are all large companies that are entering the space about the metaverse, who define that as the future vision of the internet. But I want to draw back a little bit in time, actually, when I was a child. Uh, well, actually, this is in the 80s. Those were the computers that I was actually using. With, uh, the one at uh, sort of, uh, I guess, my top left or your top right is a Texas instrument. That phone that is connected to this thing is called uh, an acoustic coupler, which is the way we connected to the internet at a speed that was very, very slow, like, you know, literally like, you know, less, less than kilobits per second. And, you know, my point on this, why I'm sharing this with you here, is because the journey into the metaverse, as we see today, really started probably, you know, 40 years ago with devices like this, where a very small portion of the world was connected to the online world. 
the way that I connected in the 80s uh, into this pre-metaverse experience was through a service called CompuServe originally, and later on other services. And CompuServe was really a text-based service. I played online games like multi-user dungeons there, you know, which was all text-based. I made friends online and actually it ultimately led to a career with Atari. I wanted to share this advertising. This was in the 80s. This was an advertising for CompuServe. And if you look at this one in particular, actually this ad could have been written for the internet, like literally 20 years later, or perhaps even for the metaverse. You know, whether you, you know, become a travel agent, a stock analyst, or sending little Herbie to another galaxy, you know, in the form of a video game, perhaps. Of course, the graphics and the resolutions aren't nearly as good as it was back then. And actually, when the internet first really properly started 30 some years ago, there were literally only tens of thousands of people online. Now, today, we have 3.2 billion active gamers in the world, 4.6 billion people connected in the world. You know, most of you who live in Hong Kong actually are probably, and you know, all of you have internet connections, you're all digitally connected. So we're all existing already in a kind of metaverse experience. The majority of us are also spending time online. What is the first thing you do in the morning? What do you spend most of your time online? Probably on a digital device, not just over Zoom calls, but texting, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is that you do online. Meaning that our daily attention is already in a digital format. We are effectively already in a kind of metaversal experience. But what is in fact the true metaverse? So we define the true metaverse as not this, meaning it's not VR, it's not AR. These are ways in which we could perhaps experience the metaverse, but it is not the metaverse itself. What we define the metaverse starts with one very basic uh, aspect, and that really is around this particular sort of um, uh, uh, concept, which is the uh, sort of access and ownership of the world's most valuable resource, and that is data. Now, the world's most valuable resource in former times, perhaps, would have been defined as something that you can grow from the ground. For instance, if you own a piece of land that had oil, for instance, that would be considered valuable. Uh, or if you were able to grow something from your land or grow something from you know, things that you owned, those would be considered valuable resources that typically came you know, from a natural resource. But this particular natural resource that powers the companies like Facebook and Google is data. And what's interesting about this resource, unlike others, is that this data comes from our time and our attention. The data concept and what we can do with this is already something that you know, we value today. If I spend time at a job, you know, I get paid a salary, for instance. So there's a value attribution that comes from your time. Data is knowledge. Knowledge is something that we can sort of compound in terms of its network effects as we make friends, as we build relationships, as we sort of gain further knowledge. But what's interesting in the digital world as we exist today, what is commonly deferred, sort of referred to as Web2, is that actually we don't own our data. Because in a contractual perspective, data is technically not a property right as we think it should be. Data is actually a contractual right. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But really what it means is that we exist on a terms of service. Each and every one of you who uses Instagram or Facebook or even WhatsApp every day you deliver this extremely valuable data, which is derived from your time and attention, which is really the most finite resource. After all, what is not more precious than your time? That is blocks of information. But these blocks of information are turned into knowledge. And this is what we do every day as humans, except in the platforms of like a Facebook or a Tencent or a Google, this knowledge tree has incredible power. And that is basically why data has become the most valuable resource. Data in the past was not considered very valuable, certainly to us, because if we download data, we can't do anything with it. It's not very precious to us. It's like a natural resource. It's a little bit like if I suddenly was finding oil in my backyard, I don't know what to do with it 100 years ago or 200 years ago. You know, I needed the machinery, the refineries that could derive value from that oil into energy. And data is the same. If you download all your data from Facebook, actually you don't know what to do with it. But if you put it to the valuable sort of, you know, refineries and engines and AI that Facebook or Google uses, they are actually able to create the most awesome network effect. <clears throat> but there is one issue. We don't own that network effect. None of us do. And in fact, what it means is that every one of us is effectively working for Facebook 
or for Google entirely for free. We think that the experience that we have on Google or Facebook is free because we don't pay for it, but actually our time and attention is being farmed. We are basically living in an age of digital colonialism. We are actually digital serfs and we exist in these digital kingdoms that are ruled by the house of Apple or the order of Microsoft, you know, basically the kingdom of Facebook, they're the new digital kings. Now think of it slightly differently. What happens to your physical life if you no longer can access Facebook or Instagram? What happens to you as an app developer if Apple or Google removes your application? <clears throat> what happens to your digital identity if Google removes you from you know, all the search indexes? Not only do you become you know, a person with lesser, lesser potential, you have actually lesser rights as a human. But the thing is, those rights, these aspects in, who control our lives are not run by judiciary. They're not run by a country that has a legal infrastructure that treats us with a kind of you know, respect for our humanity. Actually, what really is happening here is that we exist on a terms of service, a contractual right, where we literally give away all our services. We, we have all become digital dependents. Now, this chart is only one of many examples to illustrate exactly the state of the world that we live in today. You know, it, you, know, less, you know, less than 20 years ago, the most valuable companies in the world were energy companies because energy was the most valuable resource. The most valuable company today are data companies. Apple, Amazon, you know, Google, Microsoft, or even Facebook or Tencent, these are all companies that actually are worth trillions of dollars, which is unthinkable if you think about where the values of these companies were, say, even 20 years ago. And they're so powerful because they own our data. We don't own our data. We don't own our digital life. They're the ones who are able to derive value. And what it also means in large part is that those who have access and control of that data are the ones who benefit from it financially. And those who do not actually end up because sort of being part of this rising wealth inequality. Because today, the machine actually that derives the value of this, the capital, it, it's owned by capital. And the classic forms of labor in terms of work is no longer as valuable because we no longer have the ability to build our own equity or build our own capital in this particular construct. In short, basically, you know, even though you know, the, you know, the, there's a different kind of digital divide that is happening here. And the digital divide is no longer, do I have access to a computer? The digital divide that we're experiencing today is do I own my data or who controls my data? So we have this problem in the world. So why does you know, non-fungible tokens, which we think of as like the atomic unit of the metaverse actually solve this problem? And why are we so excited about it? Well, first of all, just like uh, physical property rights, non-fungible tokens represents digital property rights. <clears throat> now in the past, the reason why property rights was not really a concept that could work in the digital world is that the database, the data resided in a private database, right? It was not on blockchain. Now, what I mean by that is that the data exists inside Facebook, which means Facebook actually controls your identity. Facebook actually owns your, you know, your, 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 your data set. And actually, if you wanted to change something on it, you need to ask Facebook for permission. Or if Facebook removed it, technically they remove your digital identity, they remove your digital le legacy. When you actually use uh, sort of blockchain, that data actually goes into a public good. It goes into a public database that is not controlled by any single entity, but by the community that powers um, you know, that particular sort of blockchain. Whether this is something on Ethereum or Polygon, that doesn't matter as much. It just means that the ownership of the data is now ruled by a consensus. And the consensus is the people who run the databases, which is in this case on the blockchain distributed and therefore immutable and inalterable. That means whatever I put on the blockchain, I can't change, which basically means that if I end up putting a, sort of a digital asset, it actually becomes freely and openly composable uh, in the same way that we have in the physical world, which I'll explain shortly. But it means that now a digital asset can have a permanence, can have a legacy, can have a memory in the same way that we can have the same kind of memories uh, and legacies as we have in the physical world today. And it also means that the ownership paradigm actually allows us to um, sort of have become, it means that you know, your content, your data is no longer something that sort of is fleeting. It actually turns into an asset, which is permanent. And that means they become platforms in and of itself. 
Let me describe that a little bit in the physical concept construct as to why ownership is and always has been the platform of growth. The reason that we can own uh, that we own sort of uh, the uh, sort of decentralized ownership of cars, um, the fact that we can have decentralized ownership of cars at scale is the reason why you can have Uber or Lyft, car wash companies, you know, tire companies, people who build car parks, people who finance cars, brokerages and agents for these cars. The point being that the platform around the ownership of cars, the employment of people that are hired to maintain the car ecosystem outside of the sale of the car is far, far greater than the selling of cars. You know, whether you're a mechanic, whether you're a driver, whether you know, you're making baby seats, you know, whether you're creating sort of a service you know, for, for people basically sort of customizing or accessorizing cars, that's a far greater sum total business than just the sale of the car. The fact that you can own a house is the reason why a bank can give you a mortgage for maybe 20 or 30 years because you have ownership. Meaning that ownership historically and at present has always been the bedrock of future innovation and growth. You know, when, when, um, when the car was first invented over you know, 100 plus years ago, nobody thought that you know, a service like Uber was going to be invented, or nobody certainly thought that there would be a car park industry or thought that there would be people making baby seats or other kind of accessories for cars. They could do so because they could do it on a decentralized basis without needing to seek permission from the owner of, or from the creator of the car. They only need to do business in a peer-to-peer -peer manner with the owners of cars, adding value to that. And if you think of everything that you own today in the physical world, whether it's your iPhone or whether it's your house or whether it's a bicycle you own, you're buying accessories and components on top of the ownership of others. And that actually allows for whole new value-added services to be created. In the digital world, it is the same. When you actually have full true digital ownership through blockchain as non-fungible tokens, you, are, you actually are now dealing with decentralized owners of digital assets in the same way that in the physical world, we deal with decentralized owners of you know, physical assets. So that means that for instance, if you had a virtual sword or virtual car inside a game, it could be used in 10 different games. It could also be used in a manner where you can you know, have a rental product or you could have a brokerage or have an agent or something. And in much the same way, that is how virtual land, for instance, like our sandbox is used. Because in sandbox, I can build a house, I can build an experience, I can sell it to someone else. In fact, people are setting up third-party brokerage services, for instance, to facilitate the sale, for instance, of the virtual real estate because it is their land to do with as they please. The rules are not ones that we define once you have ownership in that sense. Actually, you are free to do with it as you will because it is your property. It is your ability to do stuff. And really what happens is it constructs new network effects in a free and decentralized manner, therefore adding more to the utility and potentially the value of these assets. Now, that means, but much like in the physical context, content now becomes assets. They become social identifiers. All the identities and our sort of uh, perspective is that what we do in the physical life is much about our social identities and social identifiers. In fact, a non-fungible token or the collection of non-fungible tokens could be referred from our perspective as non-fungible social identifiers. Because in the physical world, we buy things to take a sort of, uh, to create social identity. When you buy a car, you're saying something about yourself. When you buy clothes, you're saying something about yourself. You're not making an investment necessarily. You're not hoping to make money when you buy a shirt, right? But you're trying to say something about yourself. Certainly when you talk to our children and you talk about why they would purchase, for instance, you know, certain type of virtual skins or why certain virtual assets are considered desirable, that actually happens because, um, that actually happens because you know, it has a social status. It has a value. It says something about who they are. And it doesn't need to be expensive. It's just something that they view as sort of you know, precious or meaningful to them. Let me illustrate this example in a sort of more extreme case. On one hand, you have a board ape, which actually in terms of value is today, perhaps from a floor price, even more valuable than a Birkin bag. And a Birkin bag for those of you who are into bags is a quite valuable bag. Now, this is a luxury good. What's interesting is that what is actually are you buying when you're buying a Birkin bag? Are you buying the materials? Are you buying the 
labor of cost that made this bag, because I can assure you that the actual sort of material and time cost to make this bag is nothing compared to the value that you're paying for it. In fact, you're actually paying for entirely virtual value. You know, it's the network effect, it's the social effect, who owns it, you know, what do people say about it? And when you translate it that way, that we, you know, we think that everything you're purchasing today is 99% sort of virtual in value anyway. Even a mundane thing like buying a Nike shoe or an Asics shoe or a Puma shoe or a Reebok shoe, these are shoes and, you know, they, as a utility, they ought to all be the same. Yet we make purchase decisions based on these social identifiers, based on what it means to us as a network effect or why we think it has a network effect. None of the shoes will make us run faster. Uh, you know, we don't get superpowers from them. Yet somehow we have a preference for them because they basically, you know, we're buying a virtual value construct. So, you know, for our, you know, the, the, our, our children's generation, it's very natural already to consider that the virtual value is, you know, that virtual assets have the same value as digital assets. But, you know, from that perspective, we would argue that everything you're purchasing physically is in fact already virtual in construct. The other thing that happens, of course, is, is that in the metaverse, the, the, the open metaverse, right? The digital world in and of itself is an entirely rental economy. Because when you're using, you know, when, you, when you're deriving sort of services of value inside your favorite video game, or when you're sort of, you know, using Facebook, the economics are entirely rental because you can't own it. Which means that the value is low and therefore has to be subsidized with things like advertising. But in the open metaverse, you know, non-fungible tokens and blockchain, you have ownership economics. And in the same way that you don't expect to be buying your house for two times rent, you understand that there's a value for something that has a long-term value that you could monetize and capitalize upon, which is why, you know, virtual real estate, for instance, could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars uh, versus, you know, if it's rented inside a game, which is only worth tens of dollars, maybe hundreds of dollars. Right? And that may seem alien if you're not accustomed to it, but when you translate it in a physical context, maybe it starts to make more sense because it can generate yield, it may have value, it has the ability to do other things, you can construct network effects on top of it, and they can also provide the avenue for future employment. Let me illustrate that here just in a more recent example, whether it's a racing game or whether it is something like Axie Infinity, it's a game where you know, the time that you're spending inside the game the network effect that you're generating is rewarded in the form of basically, you know, uh, uh, monetary value. And, you know, think of it slightly differently. Your favorite game that you're probably playing today that you play for free, whether this is a Call of Duty or whether this is like, you know, Apex Legends or Fortnite or whatever game that might be, the free players are adding value to the game in and of itself. That's frankly why, you know, there's value in the game. And the people who pay for these games pay so they can pay play with the people who you know are playing it for free so why are the people who are spending time deriving value not being paid for the time likewise every one of us who is using facebook we make facebook valuable why are we not being paid for the time that we're spending giving value to facebook because after all if we all stop using facebook tomorrow what's the value of facebook nothing so really the concept here means that the energy and time that has value is now being translated back into the hands of the end users. Web3, as is commonly referred to, or the open metaverse, essentially is, you know, in the classic definition, the internet of ownership. The realization that true digital property rights is possible and that the same effect as we went from uh, sort of, you know, feudal societies that had no ownership into one the war there was ownership because we had sort of capitalism and sort of democratic systems in place, that essentially created a whole new wealth of value, uh, so sort of whole, whole, whole new wealth, whole new values, whole new opportunities. So the metaverse, from our perspective, functions much the same way. Countries in the you know, sort of physical context have a clear parallel, and we think again, the uh, metaverse functions the same. The countries that have strong established property rights tend to be the countries that have very good rule of law, tend also to be the countries that have the highest economic output in terms of GDP per capita. Countries that have low property rights tend to have very problematic rules of law or perhaps chaos and very low GDP per capita. This is not, this is pretty established. The metaverse is currently entirely at this bottom 20 percentile. 
in terms of what Facebook offers, you know, because they don't offer true ownership. We consider them actually kind of fake metaverses um, because you don't have ownership. You can't, you can't own your legacy, your history, your memory. So we're currently in the digital space, you know, in the place where there is no property rights, which means its economic potential is small, despite the fact that it's billions in size. In other words, what's exciting about this is that the economic potential is, you know, significantly larger if you expect that we can move people, all the billions of people who are online today, who have no property, digital property, digital ownership, into a paradigm where they can actually have digital ownership and digital property. And if we believe that to be true, then we'll see the same explosion of growth that we have seen from those countries that unlocked the dead capital that was within their societies when they went from a feudal economy into one that was capitalist with property rights. So let me close with one thought here around this very important thing that we consider sort of creative capital. And it starts with this thing, this is this imaginative thinking test that was designed by George Land and Beth Jarman in the 60s really for, for uh, NASA scientists. And it was really to try to derive uh, this question, are you born creative or are you actually made creative? It is also uh, sort of designed originally to check whether NASA scientists that could be, that might be hired, you know, could solve problems divergently as in creatively because after all, back then, and even today, when you send someone into the moon and there's a problem in space, that problem will probably not have, there won't be a rule book or manual that says what you need to do. So you need people who can creatively solve the problem. So they took similar struct constructs and created that same test to basically analyze, you know, um, you know, what happens to creativity following children, you know, from the age of five until 15 and giving the same test to adults. So, what they found was children at the age of five were able to solve problems 98% in a divergent manner, meaning creatively they could solve these problems. By the time they were somewhere between eight to 10 years of age, it was 30%, which is a rather precipitous drop, drop in terms of creative potential. And by the time they became teenagers, it was only 12%. And those who were adults, we're only able to solve problems creatively 2% of the time, which is, which is interesting enough, also perhaps roughly the number of entrepreneurs globally and, um, uh, and, and people who are you know, basically thinking and solving problems in a divergent and creative manner who you might consider sort of you know, uh, creative. It's a single digit percentile. What's sad about this, of course, is that it seems to demonstrate that in fact, all of us are born creative that we have creative capital and creative potential, but something happens in the way we're perhaps educated, in the way that we're raised, in the way that society is constructed, that we lose that creative capital. In other words, we are not born uh, sort of without creative ability. We are born with full creative ability, but somehow it is educated out of us. Now, there are many reasons behind that, especially because perhaps many of the traditional schooling systems were designed for an industrial age, but actually, what it really means now is that in this world, in the metaverse, actually our creative potential is the most important thing because creative capital is the most important value. In fact, when you think about, you know, sort of um, what I just shared with the metaverse, non-fungible tokens, actually it comes from our data. So if our data, our time is spent more creatively, we can create more value from this. In other words, creative capital has true meaning in the metaverse because that is something that we as humans are innately born to do. And where technology comes into play, such as what we see with the metaverse, is actually where the real power comes into it. I give this example of the calculator. I'm of that generation that actually was not allowed to use a calculator in school, in, in, in sort of um, high school. If we use a calculator in, uh, in class, it was considered cheating. But of course, today, that's very different. Uh, everyone uses a calculator and has computers as well. And the fact that we actually have this calculator is the reason that, for instance, a young architect can be a very creative and talented architect, but he doesn't need to be the best mental mathematician in order to be, become an architect, for instance. And in fact, lots and lots of creative talent was unlocked because of the simple tool of the calculator or simple form of early form of computing technology. And of course, with the computer today, with CAD and with other tools, we now have the ability to unlock much more creative potential because we can unlock what's natural to us 
without necessarily having to be sort of a mental computer. I'll close with this thought and then we can go into some Q&A here. You know, the metaverse, as we see, is the place in which we see this creative potential unlock. You know, 30, 40 years ago, CompuServe was basically dreaming about the fact that we'll be able to send little Herbie to another galaxy and actually create, you know, a sort of a new virtual sp space for us with new opportunities. It perhaps took like 30 to 40 years to get to where we are today. And in an age where machines can do many things better than us, whether this is in AI, whether this is in robotics, what is the one thing that we as humans will always be able to do better than machines? And that is in fact, the things that make us innately human, which we think the metaverse will deliver, which is creativity, celebrating actually the individual creativity that we have as people, keeping us real agency over it because we can now own our data, meaning that data is the valuable resource, as I mentioned before, that valuable resource comes from us, which means that we are the creators of our own equity every single day. We should own it. And the more creative and more, more divergent we are, we can be with that, the more valuable our time and our efforts that we contribute to society will be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yet. I think it, it's, it's, it's one of the most lucid and kind of clear overview of what the metaverse is I've heard so far. I think it, it was really, I learned a lot, you know, in this short 30 minutes um, of what, I, because I've, I've always thought, you know, what, what's the difference between the metaverse and the web? You know, we already have all this stuff. What's the difference? But I think, you know, looking at it from an ownership point of view, you know, got me thinking. I think that, that was very interesting. Uh, if you have questions, um, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom and uh, I'll read it out and, and yeah, I can actually see it as well on Zoom and uh, let's see if you guys have any questions. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think <clears throat> data as a, as a raw resource, a raw material or resource, data, information, knowledge, you know, I teach information design and we discuss a lot about about data information and and, and uh, knowledge and how you know a closed system actually means that we don't own all that which is interesting uh and the concept of we're working for facebook for free you know that's that's actually they're my they're, they're mining our, our time and attention i, I thought that was really thought provoking you know we think we're enjoying ourselves you know but, but in fact, we're working. We're working for somebody behind the scenes. Um, so when, when all of this is open up, how do you see, you know, the, uh, I guess the economy is going to shift, uh, you know, that, that kind of uh, economy of mining the user's attention and time. How is that going to shift? And what kind of business opportunities are going to arise because of that? Yeah, so great question. So actually, when the w one of the paradigms around ownership, just to sort of illustrate, is that the reason why um, the metaverse, the open metaverse is so important, and having the ability to own sort of our data, and what de is derived from the data, is because that is actually how we build human identities and legacy. And I, I get to the point as to what that means for business opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't necessarily have to ascribe a lot of value to it, but let's take a wedding ring, for example. It doesn't mm -hmm. have a lot of value to it per se, but the fact that I can have a wedding ring, which is really the same everywhere in the world, you could argue, but that wedding ring that I have with my wife, that has very special meaning and in its own sense is immutable. But what's also deep about this, which is what makes us human, is that we attach legacy and memory to it as we pass mm -hmm. the ring through generations. And this is not just true for rings, it's for all the things we own or the house that we live in or the things that we do that we pass on. We pass on a piece of our legacy to the next of our generations and it informs of who we are. We are fascinated with our life history. We want to know who we are, we want to know our identity. Now imagine that that is erased every time you're born, that you hadn't actually go back and trace back your culture and your history because there is no record of it or that record is mm. owned by a central identity, a central mm. organization that can remove it. 
this is the problem we have today. Our living memory right. of the digital space is not owned by us. Now, yeah. in, in this construct where that sits on blockchain, it can't be removed, which means our digital legacy is preserved forever. It means that everything can be composed on top of it. It means also that I can, I'm the owner of the data. The data will go to the places that give me the best value for my time and my data rather than being forced to it. So right now you could consider Facebook um, as a walled garden that has the best fly trap because if I leave Facebook, <laughs> actually I lose network <clears throat> effect. It's not mine, that is borrowed, right? Because Facebook is the one that <clears throat> And by borrowing that Facebook effect, I can have business opportunities, perhaps, or <clears throat> make friends, for instance, right? But in the Web3 open metaverse construct, I can take my data to any other platform who might say, right. I'll pay you for your time, or I give you something for that. Now, it, the, it, it means that the social networks of the future or the games of the future are building on top of open data platforms that right. we can compose freely on top of. Which is, yeah. you know, it's it's um, it may seem, un, you know, for those who don't follow much on the database structures of the world, they might think, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is quite ginormous because actually the data is also transparent, and which also means that I can compose on top of it. We wouldn't have one Facebook; we would have hundreds of Facebooks out there. That means us as an so individual, there needs to be a standard in in the in the way no the data is structured. Not at all. Not at all. There no. doesn't have to be a standard because. The standard is defined by whoever is creating the application that uses the data. Right. In the illustration of the car that I gave, I guarantee you, you know, the baby seat was invented 30 some odd years after the creation of the car. There was no definition of the car right. that said fit baby seat like this. <laughs> right. right. In <laughs> fact, it was human ingenuity. <laughs> they retrofitted and said, hey, we, this is how we can transport children safely, which eventually led to the beginnings of the seatbelt as well, right? So really the beginnings of one idea would lead to another idea, would lead to another idea because you have the freedom to compose openly on top of it. Mm -hmm. So it's not right. so much that a car, the car creator had to say, well, maybe someone wants to make a baby seat. Let's fit a standard for that, right? It wasn't up to that. And the same is true with the digital world where you don't have to define what that is because it's freely and openly composable you can design what that would be for, you know, for better or for worse. And we have a parallel for this in the digital world already. It's open source. When you create open source code, it may start with something <coughs> simple, but ultimately after thousands of developers have used and contributed this type of code, it has led to the formation of you know, Web3, Huawei, Lenovo, Google, everything on Android, Linux, right? Actually the entire world is, and innovation has been built on top of really the code of others. If mm -hmm. we had to recreate mm -hmm. the code every single time that we're trying to build something from scratch, innovation would be slower, invention would be slower, right. and you know, society would grow slower. So, so that's the powerful impact of constructing on top of other people's ownership and other people's <laughs> names. Yeah, you, you talk about legacy and uh, memories, but you know, the internet is also known for not being able to forget. <laughs> uh, because once it's there, it's always there. Right. How, how, how is the metaphors um, dealing with that as well? Forget well thing, forgetting things. Forgetting things. So I think the way that the metaverse would function, let's, less of forgetting things, but rather of sort of making sure that the record of change is there forever. Right. Okay. So, so that is not to say, and even the record of the consensus will be there forever. For instance, that might be something that we might disagree with the vote of that disagreement will also be permanently recorded on blockchain. Now, mm -hmm. I think this is the powerful thing because that extreme transparency, if you will, of your decision-making, especially of critical moments, actually creates a requirement to be both honest and authentic because mm -hmm. it means that, you know, you have a, a track record that is recorded. You know, if you are a bad actor, you will actually be easily identified. Today, it's in the form of a wallet. If your wallet that has hacked or taken assets, that wallet is ostracized. It can no longer trade. Uh, it is not so that I can take what's inside the wallet, but I can make sure that that wallet is isolated because the rest of the community effectively excommunicated it, right? So that's basically, that's, that's how that functions. And it creates a kind of self-policing environment. So right. 
So I, I would say that the permanence of the data, you know, um, and again, because blockchain relies on a way in which you can have a certain anonymity, means that I don't need to know who you are, but I know that it's legitimate because of the whole concept of zero knowledge proof. Right. Well, there, there are so many questions I want to ask in relation to that, but let's not do that because we have a lot of questions. We have 10 questions we need to work through. So uh, the first one is how do you see metaverse uh, in five years time? What's your crystal, what does your crystal ball tell you? <laughs> well, okay, so first of all, um, there's a lot of things that will change, but I just have a rattle off a few. Um, no, and, and one of them has to do with market opportunity, market size. Um, there are currently less than 100 million people, maybe 80 million people in the world that are effectively in what you might describe a kind of open metaverse. Most of it is not even in things like sandbox. Uh, most of it is you know, in the world of DeFi really, uh, which is more uh, sort of financially driven. So if you believe as certainly we do and even Facebook and other and Microsoft and other companies do that Web3, which is the open metaverse or the concept of that is the future, the natural sort of successor of the internet then we're going to go to billions of users. There's going to be four, five, six billion people on that. And within five years, I think we'll hit that number. Now, what happens when you grow so quickly? Everything will explode. So meaning that whatever fast growth we thought we saw in the last 12 months is very small compared to where the growth will continue to be because we're still going from, you know, less than 100 million to, you know, you know, the, you know, two, three, four, five billion people that are going to be connected on that. So that's the first one. The second thing, of course, is that we think that everything, certainly we hope, is going to be constructed and built open. So that means that closed platforms like Facebook or what, you know, Amazon or those ones are going to find it harder to compete by staying closed because the economic potential of an open framework, much like you see in free trade or open trade, is, is just too great. So you have to be open. In fact, it was a bit of a bombshell announcement when, when Facebook actually said less than two weeks ago or three weeks ago that they're actually going to have NFTs in Instagram and that they are going to accept basically these open assets inside Facebook, which is interesting because there's a question of, you know, how do the wallets interact? Is it actually open or decentralized? We'll see. But it is a recognition that you, they can't participate in this world unless they accept sort of, you know, the open frameworks. So that to me is right, essentially right. the beginning of the tearing downs of these walled gardens that we're seeing. And it means that the traditional way in which we discover content will also flip completely upside down. I don't think that we will go to the app store to find content anymore. Mm -hmm. for instance. I also don't think we'll be necessarily discovering our music on Spotify, nor will we mm -hmm. be finding sort of, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, go on Steam to necessarily download our games. We could still, but in fact, what will happen is because we own assets, whether it's a board ape or sandbox land or whatever asset that you have, you will have experiences custom built for you by platforms or service providers who say, I have a great way for you to experience your digital assets. Actually, would you like to be my customer? And can I sort of approach you? Because I can also <laughs> see what kind of customer you are because you as a customer through the ownership of the assets have now become a platform which also mm. means that we have more sovereignty, more identity and more control as an end user. Whether we get there in exactly five years or a little longer, of course, there's a little bit of extra crystal ball gazing, but that's kind of where we see the future. Now, to, to me, this is just coming full circle because Web1 was about decentralization, but the problem was that the organization of information was just too difficult for us to comprehend. And when Web2 came about, it promised a way that it could organize the data for us and therefore, you know, we gave away our data and access to that data because we couldn't monetize it ourselves to the platform. And initially they were good actors. They were basically organizing the data for us and we were able to, you know, obtain information appropriately. But that actually ended up being abused because suddenly they harvested this network effect that benefited them and not the community. And now we're going back, you know, we're, we're going from, you know, this next wave, which is the internet of ownership. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we can work through all of these. <laughs> maybe, uh, yeah, you can have a look at the Q&A box. Uh, maybe I'll read uh, the next one out. Thank you for a great presentation. I'm wondering how platforms such as the Central Land differ from previous models such as Second Life in terms of data ownership and creative capital. 
So Second Life was certainly a pioneer as a games like EVE Online to demonstrate that actually digital identities have value. Second Life, in fact, employs many people you know, to work in Second Life for a real a full-time job. They exist there and create economies of their own. Just the GDPs are in hundreds of millions of dollars, not in the billions. And one of the reasons why it's smaller compared to what you see in Sandbox or Axe Infinity or other open metaverses is that they're closed economies. They're kind of like hermit kingdoms, if you will. <laughs> it's a little bit like, well, you know, if the Sandbox was, you know, for instance, um, you know, Germany or Europe or something, well, then, you know, Second Life is like North Korea. And I don't mean this in a negative way. I just mean from an economic size, because it's a closed off from right. the world. Nobody will right. trade yeah. in the North Korea. You don't have the same potential. And proprietary. That, yes, proprietary. But, it's, but, but I think the thing that Second Life proved is that it actually was able to create trust in the transaction. Like if I bought something in Second Life, the commerce works. So in that sense, it's actually better than North Korea. And the commerce works. I can actually own something because... because uh, Second Life respected the ownership of that through maybe a contractual term, but not a sort of natural right. Now, what's interesting here is that it took Second Life 10 to 20 years to establish this trust by being mm -hmm. a good actor, which is, by the way, how societies grow. Societies grow by demonstrating trust. You know, if North Korea said, we're going to be a democratic capitalist society, it was like, yeah, right. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe that. It doesn't matter what they say. They don't have the trust because the way they behaved before demonstrated that they're not trustworthy. When you build on an open platform like blockchain, the element of verifying trust is instant. Because when you build on blockchain, you can't affect the data structure. That means whatever you publish on blockchain is immutable and transparent and, and actually accountable and authentic all at once. So really the power of blockchain here means that it creates that authentic framework on day one. I don't need to mm. prove that I'm a good actor. I'm forced to be a good actor. And that's why open economy is built on sort of, you know, uh, something like Sandbox, just have a stronger network effects because you can begin with verified trust that you can't do on things like a new game, for instance, that might say, hey, we're like Second Life, we'll respect your property rights. Well, prove it. How are you gonna do that? I'll show you, it takes time. Mm. Right. Okay. Which industry sectors would be most uh, would, would would most benefit from metaverse? Retail, not just commercial, right? Yeah. So first of all, I think <laughs> everything will be affected by the open metaverse. I don't think that there is one particular industry that will necessarily benefit more than the other, and that's because we're not dealing with an incremental shift here. What we're really dealing with is an exponential shift of everything that we traditionally thought of. So I would say in that construct, um, maybe if I was to emphasize and focus around one thing is that we are now the creators of our own value. And as creators of our own value, it means that the kind of industries that are more focused on creativity, um, individual talents uh, are, are going to be perhaps prized correctly. Uh, what I mean by that is, an artist is going to get their fair value, which they didn't get before, because the middleman, whether it was the agent or the platform, mm. took most of that value. Music mm. is a great example too. Musicians can't make much money in the world of Spotify. <laughs> you get millions of streams, <laughs> and yet actually you make no money at all. So you can only make money in a momentary way, like a show, but you actually don't own your intellectual capital. You think you do because you're the creator of the music, but in reality, actually you're, de you're dependent on Spotify, right? Now in the construct of Web3 with ownership, actually you don't need to make money with a million streams. You can make money with less. So that also means more value is derived from that. So I would say that again, the creative industries are probably going to be the biggest net winners, not because, you know, and I say this, not because, you know, it favors them more, just because it unlocks the potential capital that is sort of was unfairly given to the middlemen back to the yeah players. right so eliminate the middlemen so there's a lot of yeah but more value then. will be created too because more diversity will come because there's better sure. economics so that means right. it'll be more natural for us to become a musician uh, or yeah. a artist or a uh, or a another kind of creative job that uh, was not sustainable before and you can cater for uh, niche markets as well can't you? Correct. So one yeah. of the examples I, I often give is like the <clears throat> digital world of video games. 
is like McDonald's. You have to create a product that, and music kind of too, you have to create a product that millions of people can consume. In fact, in the video gaming mm. world, if you don't have tens of millions of users, it's a failure. Mm. You can't make money on it, mm, right? Mm, mm, mm. right? Now, imagine if you're running a restaurant that had to cater to the audience, that had to cater to tens of millions of, the tastes of tens of millions mm. of users, right? Mm, 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 <laughs> we would all be eating fast food and we'll be all eating a certain kind of food. We can't have, you know, fine dining experiences. We can't have right. big restaurants that create new experiences because it's not valued <clears throat> this way. But in this construct, you know, you can now have indie games, for instance, that might only have tens of thousands of players, but they, <laughs> yeah, but they right. sustain the game, which actually what it That's means... That's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing because it also means we can have much more diverse creative expression in all sure. forms of digital assets, whether it's music, yeah. content, games, and so on. And so I see this as a kind of real creative renaissance, you know, born out of the metaverse. So we're no longer dictated by the mass audience. Right. We're, yeah. That's interesting. Do, do you want to see which questions you want to answer? We, we're we running out of time, but maybe do you want to pick some questions you want to answer? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fine. I don't particularly care. Yeah. You just pick what you think is right. Uh, let's see. I need to read it first. <laughs> <laughs> I just see it's one here. It's very long. Just, <laughs> this one. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so I just see this one here. It talks about if metaverse platforms are using blockchain in an open and transparent structure, then what will be the future for proprietary platforms? Well, the proprietary platforms are going to die. That's <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> it's a very simple answer. Do you think? I mean, and, and I think, um, um, or are they going to shrink? Take a look at proprietary code versus open source. What's bigger? Open source is clearly the winner here, right? And mm, you know, mm, mm, you mm, take a look at countries that are proprietary in nature or have very tough proprietary structures in terms of the way they deal with it. They are smaller economies than the ones that are more open and the ones that are more transparent. You know, one of the things about building in an open manner, the proprietary aspect, actually the secrecy isn't just, oh, I have some knowledge that you don't have or some technology that you don't have. Actually, it breeds, um, it, it closes intellectual knowledge to a smaller right. audience, right? Yes. So, right. so, so societally, actually, closed systems are bad because yep. I'm mm. not sharing ideas with you, which means I'm not lifting society as a whole. I'm right. really yeah. more selfish in terms of hiding for my own benefit, right? And that actually, mm -hmm. while that may seem to benefit the individual, societally, it is a net negative. So mm. broadly speaking, anything that's truly open has typically won over open source being the most sort of um, sort of technological example in this sense. But you know, if you take a look at, for instance, you know, uh, free trade economies, right, global systems, right, again, you can't compete with that scale. Mm, right. Uh, I'm going to ask on behalf of our principal, Dr. Lelian Nong. Do you of think course. there is a need to offer a training program, say, a two-year high diploma program for the rising demand in this area? <laughs> so, first of all, uh, yes, right? I think that prepared, preparedness for this is important. But I think preparedness for this isn't necessarily just technical in a vocational sense. It is experiential because in some ways mm. we already exist in that environment. I would also say that two years is far too long because the industry ah, okay. as a whole is moving so rapidly. Um, so I think, I think, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, you could be metaverse ready since, you know, in three to six months. I don't think you need to do right. this in two years, right? Um, that's because, encouraging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that's not to say that you can further your knowledge in the space over time, but you can be productive in the metaverse actually very quickly. I, I want to follow that, follow up on that question with what kinds of skills can be transferable to working with the metaverse? So I think the general skills that um, we value in sort of a human way, shall we say, are the ones that typically I think will do quite well in the metaverse, meaning mm. creativity, expression of ideas, mm. right? These mm -hmm. are natural things. But you don't necessarily have to be the one that creates the ideas. You could also execute on the ideas. So there's a number of companies in Hong Kong as well, but all over the world that really are metaverse architects. And so they build and create and construct. And these are the new kind of jobs you could say, but you know, there's many new jobs. If you think 20 years ago, 
that you would be a web designer, you would say, what kind of job is that? Or 10 years ago, yes. I would be an app developer. What kind of job is that, right? So, yeah. you know, and today, how many people are employed in those particular kind of services? So it's the same here today, right? Which is that you can, you know, the metaverse skills might be a little bit different, but they're not that different from knowing how to design a web page, except slightly different tools, or knowing how to mm. build an app, but slightly different tools. But I think the ones um, uh, uh, who, who have ideas, creativity around mm. that, are going to be the ones who will do very well. And I think, right. I think the tools to do so are also much more powerful than they were before. Effectively, you know, imagination, I think, is, has always really been humanity's greatest strength. And it yeah. is one that really is sort of um, individually and collectively rewarded much more strongly in the metaverse. Mm. Very good. Let's see. The mainstream sees the metaverse as an opportunity for getting rich. See the bored ape. The price is not affordable for regular people. It just not it doesn't match with the true meaning of the metaverse. What's your view on that? How to further develop or promote the metaverse to the rest of the population? It seems it's still far, so far from us. Well, so first of all, uh, while the board apes or sandbox land are you know desirable assets, that doesn't mean that you have to necessarily start with that, right? In other words, if we want to sort of you know, so I I think the way to look at the metaverse is like the age of exploration meaning that you're basically constructing new societies all over the place. Mm. Sandbox mm. is, you know, in a current construct, kind of like the New York or Hong Kong or, you know, Bel Air, if you will, of the metaverse perhaps, but it's not the only experience, right? It could be perhaps where you might want to be in the end, but it doesn't have to be the only experience. That's like saying there's only one city in the world or there's only one country in the world. That's not true at all. You know, if you're living, if you live in the US, you know, what's the difference between living in New York or Boston or Chicago? Geographically, they're not that far apart. Practically, mm. they're quite different, right? And we choose mm. to be in those places for, for many reasons. So through the question of inclusion, it's about entering other metaverses or new metaverses or new spaces. So yes, you can't afford a board ape maybe because that's expensive. But what people forget sometimes is that buying a board ape in the beginning was less than $100, maybe $200. It was not <laughs> you know, in, when we sold our first plots of land for Sandbox in, I think it was in 2019, it was $25 per land, right? It was mm. not expensive at all. And, you know, <laughs> and I'm not saying that, you know, for Sandbox, the, you know, the likelihood of that price happening again is low. Just how the likelihood of buying sort of, you know, real estate for relatively low prices in Hong Kong is low too, right? Because of how it's developed. It's just developed that way more rapidly. But that doesn't mean you have to necessarily just build in sandbox. You can build in other sort of new metaverses that are being constructed and you can have a vote in this one. The metaverse mm -hmm. is still being constructed. It's the age of exploration, which means that you have opportunity in many, many ways. Don't look at just the things that, you, that are successful. These things that are successful or appear to have high value were developed over a, a number of years, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's like... It's so like, new things are gonna be developed continuously. I mean, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, fretting over the price of real estate in Hong Kong if you had a chance to buy it 30 years ago. I mean, you know, you can't, uh, it's different, right? Um, but but you, can, you, can, you can build somewhere else. You can, and, and to me, this is what's interesting is that you can choose to enter the spaces that you're most comfortable in. It's early, right? We're not, we're not at all sort of uh, late at the moment. So, you know, if it's not sandbox, it's something else. Yeah. I saw a question here, um, you know, that there are obvious kind of benefits, commercial benefits to uh, yes. setting something up in the metaphors, but how about for public sector? Like, like say for, for Hong Kong Design Institute, well, what's the benefit of having a presence in, in the metaphors? Well, first of all, I think having a presence in the metaverse is not, a, is not an option, meaning that everyone has to be present there because you have yes. to be able to uh, you sort of have the mind share in the space in where you can innovate in new ways. How are you going to be able to, uh, for instance, let's say teach or express or learn about the metaverse if you're not in the metaverse yourself? Right. Kind of yeah. to do that. But there's many other innovations that happen in the metaverse that aren't entirely 
sort of, let's call it technical or visual, which is only one aspect. One of the things that we didn't talk about are, for instance, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. These are basically structures in which communities self-organize and create consensus. Now, for instance, with, as a design center, actually experimenting around public DAOs or your own DAOs is very interesting because mm. you can really experiment on community involvement or, for instance, mm. on sort of approaches to democratic systems, but at the pace mm. of technology, right? You know, we always build consensus anyway in our daily lives, whether it's a small group or a large group. And that's an, another example that you can now do at scale. So the, the involvement in the metaverse isn't, you know, just how can I sell something that is of value? How can I build virtual land? That's one way, but it covers all aspects uh, of, of life. Hmm. We are running out of time, but do you want to pick a couple more to answer? <laughs> there, there's some in the, the, the chat box as well. Uh... Um, yeah, so there's an interesting question, which I think many people ask, so I think I'll pick it up. It's this metaverse is not a monopoly, which is what we like, by the mm. way, how to ensure mm. the competitive edge of your metaverse. Mm. So yeah. I think this is, this is why we think the metaverse and open metaverse is great. Because it, take the parallel of a country. If mm. the country does not treat you well, then mm. in the physical world, you need a passport, you need to travel, you need to move out. Actually, even if you don't like to live here, you can't leave, you're stuck, right? Which means that the country can do things to you regardless of be treating you badly because you have no choice, which we have seen in you know, places like North Korea or Venezuela or other places that are rather undesirable places to live, but the people have no choice. In the metaverse, the data is yours in the open metaverse, which means that you can experience to move your assets anywhere you want as long as they give you an experience better than the other one. What that means is that there will be true competition of services because mm. if you don't give them your data, they can't have value. And so mm. the optimism to me around this is that while there is no particular competitive edge in terms of the pure technological mode for controlling the network effect, actually your competitive edge is around providing not just the best technical service, but also the best community, best human type of service as well. Mm, so mm, mm. when you think about um, culture, right? I mean, you know, the glue of culture, the glue of community is like the glue of friendship. That friendship isn't monetizable in terms of value, right? You know, I don't, I don't go to what well, some people might, but generally people don't choose to be part of a community because they think how much money I can make from that, right? That's only <laughs> one aspect, right? If, 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 if at all. But as a result, we choose to be in certain social groups, not because of money, but because of values, because of connectivity, because of sure. you know, culture, right? And that becomes the glue, meaning the glue is a human glue. The glue is not a texture. I think forces us to be much more empathetic in our design of all of our systems, which if you right. think of modern leadership today, Actually, which, who are the leaders that we aspire to be or who are the leaders that we think are great? They're not the ones who have the most iron-fisted will or the ones who are most <laughs> right. right? Even though it might be efficient, they're the ones who are most empathetic, who can listen to you, who adapt to you. So I think this is really an illustration of what we already desire, but now we can do that at scale. And that is exciting to me because it's a positive reinforcement mechanism because if you are a bad actor, and then I won't give you my data. So the social community aspects, and, and really it's human-centered design, right? It is <laughs> human-centered design. Human it, is, design uh, would, it is also community-centered design. Yeah, right. That's a, very good, that's a very good way of looking at this. Let's pick up, pick up on two more questions, if you're up for it. Uh, yes, yes. you you're yes. still okay? Yeah, please Let's, go ahead. Uh, Let's see, I've, we've already done this one. Uh, I personally studied and interested in uh, XR development. What is the necessary skills, applications, or knowledge that I have to know if I want to develop games involving blockchains? Right. So, I mean, the tool chains are all developing as it is. However, I would say that, uh, you know, if you want to build specifically on chain, 
depends on what chain you use. There's new languages to learn, whether this is Solidity or Rust if you do Solana or Cadence if you do Flow, right? So that's an example, right? Um, but in terms of visual tools, they're kind of the same in terms of, you know, graphic tools, or if you do sandbox, you can do the voxel builder. So there's slightly different new tool chains, but broadly speaking, the interfaces should be fairly, um, fairly, fairly similar. The one thing I will say around anything developing in the blockchain space is that while you can learn the tools in terms of how to interact and operate with them, uh, you know, the technical tools, actually what we value in particular is when you design them, how you think in terms of community effects, uh, right. which I think is, yeah. which yeah. I think we as individuals ought to be quite good at because humans broadly are social creatures. We never analyze around it, but actually if we think about what's good for our social network, then I think you will have success in that field, which by the way, is very different from the traditional sort of, let's call it web two or old way of thinking where it was about monopolizing information because you were mm -hmm. aiming for a zero sum outcome. You know, the zero sum outcome meaning I, you know, I win and you lose, right? But yeah, in the metaverse, right. which is, you know, which is cross chain, you actually have, you know, maybe different levels of success uh, or failure, but uh, you, you still have a shared network effect. Meaning that mm -hmm. if someone does very well, right? Then the other person in the same network may not do as well as you, but also does well because the shared network effect is shared across. It's a little bit like, you know, when a country is doing well, when the economy of a country is doing well, there might be some groups that do better than others, but broadly mm -hmm. the entire nation succeeds. So this is how one could think of it. And if you think in that effect, it also encourages more sharing. I would say, for instance, that, you know, um, one of the powerful things uh, and, and actually blockchain, because it's open, it naturally promotes it because everything's transparent. Everything can be read. Um, but you know, one of the advantages and let's call it secret sauces of Silicon Valley, uh, which is hard to translate to because you don't really see it physically, you have to feel it, mm -hmm. is the willingness to share information openly at almost any time. Right, right. Meaning so that's that, the opposite of the proprietary mindset right. isn't it but the, and the proprietary mindset starts really from how you're educated too for right. instance if you if you're educated in a way where i can you know i get rewarded for being number one in the classroom well then how do you get to be number one in the classroom is by perhaps <laughs> sharing with others because it's not about community growth it is about individual yes. growth, right which means right. that i am the winner and everyone else is the loser right now, in yeah, that scenario, yeah, that's quite ingrained, isn't it, in, in our minds, you know, yes, the and, way and we're so, brought up. Yeah, well, in some places, right? So then what happens in is, some is places, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So, <laughs> so what, what then happens is that you're not built to share. You're built mm -hmm. to sort of, you know, um, sort of not share, in fact, because you consider that yeah. sort of a way in which, you know, you're, you're losing your so-called advantage. Mm -hmm. But actually what yeah. you're doing is you're closing your network effect. Because if you're not sharing, you can't obtain. And the friction of ideas doesn't happen in an island. It never does, right? So the societies that actually have poor sharing or poor, have poor network effects. Poor network effects means poor innovation and poor ideation. And unfortunately, yeah, right. the decline of, you know, basically many places. Silicon well, Valley, there's a follow-up question that relates to that. Maybe uh, we, yes. we could do that with we'll one more minute. If metaverse platforms are using blockchain to build an open and transparent structure, as you said, then what will be the future for proprietary platforms who are closed off and who control and own and utilize the data like Facebook or similar ones? What could be the company's strategies? So I think I like, we're talking about big corporations here, right? Yes, right. So I think what I do think... they have to change? So <laughs> first of all, I think that um, those companies, if they don't, you know, a transparency and openness comes in many flavors. And, you know, to me, the important thing around this is, is that I think corporations need to transform themselves in, in effect to have a public good. I don't mean that they're charity. This is not right, right? We're not saying that you can't be capitalist, but, you know, you, you're, you're building a business. You don't have to be a social enterprise, but you have to be willing to share and be of a public good, shall we say. And that's the network effect that's constructed in open source. I you know when you're running a business, whether it's a restaurant or something small or even something larger, 
you're generally trying to create a positive effect in the world, right? I mean, I hope so. But there are certain type of businesses that have been created that don't do that. They are about extraction. They are about taking value because of the construct of capitalism, the way that it is set up. In that environment, proprietary knowledge is an advantage, but actually we think will ultimately fail for many, mm -hmm. for many reasons. Um, one of them is the fact that you know, a proprietary network can never compete with an open one because the network effect is too large, right? Closed, closed source code cannot compete with open source code, right? Uh, and in the same way, a banking system, a traditional banking system can compete with DeFi, which is open. And that's interesting because DeFi in and of itself might not, be, might not appear as efficient, but the transparency that it has is unbeatable. And the fact that people can generate more economic opportunity in an open and transparent manner means that the financial knowledge is also broader, meaning, oh, I understand how he's doing it because I see his patterns. I can learn from that. I can learn from the best trader or I can learn from the best investor because I see what he does transparently on chain. Whereas in the old world or let's say existing world in some cases, how he invests, what access he has is proprietary. He doesn't share it. So only he benefits. But actually, again, in that effect, he benefits for his own benefit. Society around him does not benefit. And that's actually broadly a net negative. So, so I think the idea here between building open is that you should have success, but your success sort of trickles down to society, not in a monetary sense, but in a sort of shared knowledge and network effect sense. Sounds very utopian to me, but I mean, <laughs> let's, let's hope it turns out that way. I, I, I really hope. <laughs> Uh, I think that's all we have time for today. Uh, right. I mean, I, I wish we had more time because we just have a lot of really great questions and uh, yeah, a lot of good insights. Uh, yeah, that was really that was really enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank so uh, sorry we couldn't entertain all of your questions. So let's see if we have another opportunity to to hear. Yeah, you know, uh, to share with us another time. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, audience as well. So see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. you. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.